we just got through with Revelation. And now I just want to start back and go back through Genesis and do it all over again. And I just want to do this until I die or until the rapture happens. Just keep back going back through the Bible. It's not going to be exactly the same. I'm not going to do it exactly the same. We'll see different stuff each time. The Bible, you know, the Bible's a never-ending story. You can't never figure it all out. And each time that you go through the Bible, when you go through it the next time, you're going to be a completely different person. So I'm going to say things that I didn't say before. I've learned a lot of things that I hadn't learned the last time. So we'll start back, and this will be Genesis Overview Part 2. And I'm just going to call it Journey Through Genesis. Now, Genesis is also called the first book of Moses. And Genesis is the first book of the what's called the Pentateuch. And the Pentateuch is the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the book of Genesis is going to cover the first 2,000 years of human history. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Genesis, like gene, generations, generate. But it's the book of beginnings. The theme of Genesis is the beginnings of everything. The author of Genesis, obviously Moses. And Moses is possibly taken back in time to see the events of Genesis as they unfold, just as the Apostle John gets taken forward in time to see the book of Revelation unfold. I'm not sure exactly how the process worked. I don't know if if the Lord just had Moses sit down and he just put all this stuff into his brain or if he showed it to him. Like and, and he saw the events unfold as they took place. I just know I believe it. I believe everything Moses wrote is, is perfect. And that there's no errors in this. There's no exaggerations. It wasn't em embellished in any way. It's just all perfect. And right there laid out for us. Now the length of Genesis is 50 chapters. 1,534 verses. And around 38,262 words. And I say around that because I didn't count them myself. And if you look at different study Bibles and if you look at, um, you know, different things people have wrote down about Genesis, you're going to see variations on how many words there are. Because, you know, whoever counted it miscounted. So... That gives us a general idea, though, around 38,262 words. So 50 chapters, 1,534 verses, and around 38,262 words. Historically, now we get into our three applications. The historical application, the practical, and the doctrinal. Historically, Genesis records the beginnings of everything. The beginning of heaven, earth, creatures, covenants, sin, death, races, nations, Israel, and so on and so forth. You see the beginnings of everything in Genesis. Now, practically speaking, when, you, when I read Genesis, I see everything began with God. God was before everything. He was here before the beginning. The only reason that anything is here is because of Him. Everything begins with God. Everything is seen by God. Since the start of human history, everything that went on was seen by God. No, nobody could hide from God in Genesis. Um, nothing went on without God knowing about it, being involved in it. Uh, everything revolves around God. Everything from the beginning to the ending revolves around Him, whether people know it or not. And it ends with God. So practically speaking, that's what you see. It's all about God. In the beginning, God. But yet, people don't include God in anything. Yet he's there seeing it go on. Now doctrinally speaking, 
In Genesis, doctrinally speaking, you have major doctrines that are pictured in Genesis. For example, salvation in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 is pictured. The Godhead in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 is pictured. Jesus Christ and his bride is pictured in chapters 2 through 4. The rapture is pictured in chapter 5. Israel and the tribulation is pictured in chapters 6 through 9. So it pictures many major doctrines of the Bible. Now Genesis is made up of 11 stories, 11 main stories. Now here's you a good breakdown for Genesis. Chapters 1 through 2 show you the creation. Chapters 3 through 4 show you Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Chapter 5 shows you the generations of Adam. 6 through 9, Noah's flood. Chapter 10, the generations of Noah. Chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Chapters 25 or chapters 12 through 25, Abraham and Isaac. Chapters 26 through 27, Jacob and Esau. Chapters 28 through 35, the life of Jacob. Chapter 36, the generations of Esau. And chapters 37 through 50, the life of Joseph. That's a really good breakdown to help you remember Genesis. If you can remember those 11 main stories, then you've got the book of Genesis down in your mind. Now, here's an interesting thing. You got numerology in Genesis. The first 13 chapters show us uh, numbers 1 through 13 and their, their numerology. For example, chapter 1, 1 represents unity. And in chapter 1, the creation is united. There's not any sin going on. The creation's united. Chapter 2, you got division. 2 is the number of division, and in chapter 2, a man is divided. The man's divided, and God makes a woman. Chapter 3, 3 is the number for structure, because things are made up of threes. If you studied that before, you realize things are made up of threes. And in chapter 3, you have three temptations, three sinners, and three curses. Chapter 4, 4 is the number of the earth. That's where Cain brought, bring, brought his offering from, is from the earth in Genesis chapter 4. When he kills Abel, where does Abel's blood fall? To the earth. Chapter 5. 5 is the number of grace, but it's the number of death as well, as you see many times. And what is chapter 5 about? The first time you see a, a man just die of natural causes, Adam was 900-something years old, and he died. In Adam, all die. Five is the number of death. First time you see a man die of natural causes, chapter 5. Chapter 6, 6 is the number of man. It describes man perfectly in Genesis chapter 6. The Lord sees that the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually. Chapter 7. 7 is the number of completion. What happens in chapter 7? The ark and preparations for the flood are complete. Chapter 8, you got new beginnings. 8 the number of new beginnings. Noah starts over with 8 people. He, he comes off that ark. He's the only family on the planet. He's got a fresh start. He starts over with eight people in chapter eight. Eight's the number of new beginnings. Chapter nine, you got fruitfulness. What does God tell Noah to do? Be fruitful and multiply. Nine's the number of fruitfulness. Chapter 10, 10's the number of Gentiles. And in chapter 10, you got the first mention of Gentiles in the Bible. Chapter 11. 11 is like a number that 
you see when there's a calm before the storm or some type of tragedy like it's calm and then a tragedy happens and what happens in chapter 11 they are uniting and they're prosperous in Babel but then a fall happens God confounds their language chapter 12 you got Israel and 12 is the number for Israel and what happens Abram is called out and he's the father of them all chapter 13 13 is the number of rebellion what do you have in Genesis 13 13 it says but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly you got Sodomites who are open rebels against the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 13 and verse 13 and then the verse has 13 words so the Bible is an amazing book you take all these things into consideration it shows you that the Bible could not have been written by man then you got in uh, Genesis 10 sections of generations the first one the generations of heaven and earth that's chapter 2 chapter 2 verse 4 to chapter 4 verse 26 the generations of adam that's chapter 5 and verse 1 to chapter 6 and verse 8 the generations of noah chapter 6 verse 9 to chapter 9 verse 28 the sons of noah chapter 10 verse 1 to 11 and verse 9 of Shem, chapter 11, verse 10, to verse 26. Of Terah, that's chapter 11, 27, to 25, 11. Of Ishmael, that's 25, verse 12, to verse 18. Of Isaac, 25, 19, to 35, 29. Of Esau, 36, and verse 1, to verse 43. Of Jacob, 37 2 to chapter 50 26 so 10 sections of generations now let's get into the book and look at chapter 1 now chapter 1 you got the creation in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth so the Bible starts out with in the beginning but God is way before that I mean, you can't confine God to time. You see, we can only really think in terms of time, and that's why I can't ever really understand how that God's always been here and always will be here. I just know that when I was born, it was like an hourglass was turned upside down, and my sand has been running down ever since. And the greatest thing you can do in the time you've been given is get out of the way of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son the Lord Jesus Christ. And God showed you at the beginning of his book that light divides from darkness. So that's the greatest thing you can do with your time. You see darkness, get away from that darkness. In Genesis 1, 2 through 4, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So God shows you that if you're a child of light, get away from the darkness. They don't go together. God is a divider. He shows you right there that he doesn't think light and darkness have any business becoming roommates. God said, let there be light. And guess what? Men love darkness rather than light. But you got born again, and God went inside your soul and flipped the switch. And darkness couldn't hang around there no longer. So if you've got light on the inside, why are you walking around in the dark on the outside? But it says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. These are literal 24-hour days. Notice, it says, The evening and the morning. We're the first day. And do you realize that when you mess around with God, that you're messing around with the being that named the light day, and he's the one that made darkness be called night, 
God called the light day and the darkness he called night. You're messing around with the ancient of days. If you're messing around with the person that's old enough to call to be the one who named light day and darkness night, you're messing around with the wrong person. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So once again, he's dividing once more. He put a space between the waters of our planet and the waters that are under the, the third heaven. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. You see, whatever God does and says is so. All he has to do is say it, and it was so. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Notice that this verse in Genesis 1.13 where it says in the evening and the morning were the third day, that's the first number 13 in the Bible. Remember we said that's the number of rebellion, and it's the first verse that doesn't mention the name God in the Bible. That's a crazy thing. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. So the Almighty is the one who put the sun and moon in place. Have you ever heard someone heard about someone that loves somebody so much they say they think they just hung the moon? Well, if you worship the Almighty God, then you're worshiping the one who really did hang the moon and the sun. And he could use the sun as a weapon if he wanted to. And he does sometimes in the Bible. He makes it stand still. He makes it scorch people. He makes it go pitch black. I mean, you're messing with a God that has a control panel for the sun just in his mind and in his fingertips. You're messing with something so powerful that it makes you like a little less than an ant. I mean, when you go outside, you look down at an ant hill and you think, wow, I'm so superior to these ants. Uh, God is infinitely times that more superior to you than you are to those ants. You're messing with the wrong God if you're messing with God. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. If God can make the birds able to fly, then why do you think he'll have a problem causing you to fly without wings at the rapture. Why do you find that hard to believe? Why do you find anything hard to believe if God is involved? I've never understood that. You see, if God can create so many different kinds of creatures with amazing abilities, then why do you think he also wouldn't have amazing abilities that are even more amazing? And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. You see, we look at things in the ocean, and we're amazed by it, like the whales. But, you know, they say they haven't even discovered everything that lives in there. Imagine being able to see deep down in the darkest crevices of the oceans. God made it. He can see it. He can tr keep track of every living thing in the waters, the whales, the sharks, every type of fish in the sea. He doesn't have to put trackers on it like they do. He just knows. He knows where each and every one is. It says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. To all the people who care more about a dog than a baby, remember that God gave man dominion over the animals. God doesn't care more about a dog in a hot car than he does a baby in a hot car. You see, this woman said to me one time that she would rather a baby be left in a hot car in the summer than for her precious little doggie to be left in a hot car in the summer. That's a sick woman. She's one sick puppy herself. She doesn't understand that the animals were made for man, not the other way around. The animals do not have dominion over man. Man has dominion over the animals. Animals don't get saved. Animals can't get born again. 
Animals can't have the relationship with God that man can. Man is more important to God than any animal. So God created man in his own image. And the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So to all of you guys out there who believe in this man-on-man -man stuff, I direct you to this, this verse. He made them male and female. He created them male and female. You see, the Lord is about brotherly love, but not that kind of love, not that kind of brotherly love y'all are doing. He created them male and female, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. A man-on-man -man relationship cannot do that. They can't be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God made man and gave them ability to reproduce. And just look at look into all the miracles that go into a woman having a baby and tell me that God doesn't exist. It's all too convenient for an almighty God not to be behind it. And that's why he says men with men is something that's not convenient. In Romans one twenty eight. He talks about men with men doing that which is unseemly. He talks about the woman living in the natural use of the man and going after one another. And then he says in Romans one twenty eight, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You see, a man and a woman coming together to be fruitful and multiply there's a lot of stuff there that's very convenient, way too convenient for there not to be a divine creator. But a man on man, think about it. That's not convenient at all. And I don't want to get in too much detail on that, but obviously, think about it. There's nothing convenient there for that. But that's Genesis chapter 1, and in chapter 2, you got a more detailed creation of the man and woman. Uh, it's just giving you a more detailed creation. Uh, look at the creation of man and woman. So Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, 7 through 9. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's why you see it from dust thou art. To dust you're going to return. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. The only reason you're here right now is because Almighty God one day breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And if it wasn't for that, you wouldn't even be breathing that breath right now. The very breath you're breathing started with the breath God gave to Adam. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Notice throughout this chapter that God is a worker. Uh, he doesn't just tell us throughout the Bible to work with our hands and to be a, a workman, needs not to be ashamed, and then not do it himself. Notice he formed a man, he breathed into his nostrils, he planted a garden, and there he puts the man whom he formed. And he's not going to tell Adam to do something that he won't do. He's given Adam a job to work, and the Lord worked. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God is forming, planting, making things grow, and he isn't asking us to do anything that he wouldn't do. Genesis 2.19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. He gave Adam a job to do right away. You have a job you can do for the Lord. For Adam, it was naming the animals. For you, it's going to be something else. For me, it's something different than you, most likely. But the Lord made all the animals. But he wants Adam to take part in his work. He, wants you, he wanted Adam to build on what he had done. 
The Lord wants you to take part in his work. Build on something that he's got going over here. Maybe with somebody else even. So the Lord wants you to take part in the work. In Genesis 2, 20 through 21, And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So Adam had to get a surgical operation here, and he didn't have to worry about the, the sleepy stuff not working the anesthesia or whatever. He didn't have to worry about a scalpel being left inside of him. The Lord has something much better than a surgeon's hand. Uh, Adam had the hand of Almighty God working on him, so the Lord could play the operation board game and never lose. I mean, his hand uh, never trembles. It never shakes. It never gets tired. Uh, the Lord could play the operation board game driving on an old country road in an earthquake. And never touch the sides or make the buzzer go off or anything like that. So he got Adam's rib out of there and made Adam an helpmeet for him. Verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So the Lord can use you to create a new creature. He used Adam to make a new creature here. Anytime you give the gospel and someone gets saved, the Lord used a piece of your time. The word you had hid in your heart, he used that and you helped play a part in bringing in a new creature. Just like Adam, a piece of, his, a piece of him is how God formed Eve. God will use you, his workmen, to give the gospel out, and you used a piece of your time, a piece of your heart to get that gospel out, and you were uh, took part in helping God make a new creature. Chapter 3, you got the fall of man. Genesis 3, 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, you shall, not, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What does the devil love to do to man? Well, he wants to make them desire things that are forbidden, that they're not supposed to have. And that's what he's doing to Eve here. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. So notice how the serpent goes directly against what God actually said. He says, he says in Genesis 3, 5, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Isn't it something that the serpent only gives credit to God, only gives credit to God knowing something, if it's going to benefit him? Any other time, he wants you to make wants to make you think that God doesn't know anything. But here he's trying to trick Eve, saying, you know, you, he just doesn't want you to eat off this tree because he knows when you eat thereof, you're going to be as gods, knowing good and evil. And Eve thought it a desirable thing to be a god, obviously. And man hasn't come any further than that. They still want to be the greatest, no matter what field they are in. Their desire is usually to be the most high in that field. They want to be the greatest. It says in Genesis three twelve and 13, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So Eve ate the fruit, obviously. She gave it to her husband with her and he did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So Adam blamed the woman, the woman blamed the serpent, and the serpent still comes after the bride today. He came after the first bride, Eve. He comes after the bride of Christ today and tries to come between you and the last Adam.
the Lord Jesus. In Genesis three fourteen and 15, it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, this is the first direct prophecy of Jesus. I mean, we've already seen him in pictures and types and stuff, but now you got the first direct prophecy of Jesus. Jesus, the promised seed. And that is the theme of the book of Genesis. And there are standout men in Genesis who are carrying the seed. First, you got Adam here. You got Seth. You got Enoch. You got Noah. You got Shem. You got Abraham. You got Isaac. And you got Jacob. They're carrying the seed that's promised here. So this seed that's going to come... It's going to bruise the serpent's head. And the serpent's main mission now is to try and destroy that seed. He's going to do whatever he's got to do to destroy the seed. And it's crazy how close he comes many times to destroying the seed, but he doesn't, he doesn't get it accomplished. And you'll see him even do it in the book of Matthew when he tries to get Herod to have all the children to and under. To be killed. In Genesis three twenty through 21. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife. Did the Lord God make coats of skins. And clothed them. The Lord shows them an example. Of what he's going to require. To temporarily. Temporarily cover. Their sin. And that's a bloody animal sacrifice. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. You see, he doesn't want Adam in his sinful state going in there and taking off that tree, eating that fruit and living forever. In his sinful state. You see, imagine there being a tree on this planet somewhere where you could go there and eat the fruit off of it and live forever. Everybody would be looking for that tree. I mean, people would be killing each other to get to that tree or to get the fruit off of that tree so that they could live forever. There, God had to put some type of guard up around it to keep people out. The temptation of man would be too great to get in there. So it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Everyone and their brother would be trying to get the fruit off of that tree and live forever. The only problem is that they would live forever in their sinful state. So right there you've, you've, got, you've seen in chapter 3 the first covenant God made with man is broken. <clears throat> the agreement was Adam and Eve could live forever in a sinless state, doing whatever they wanted to, eating whatever they wanted, except for that tree. That was the only condition in this covenant. You can't eat off the tree. What do they do? They, they eat it off the tree. And now they brought sin into the world. Sin came into the world and death, for by one man, sin came into the world and death by sins, for that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, chapter 4, you're going to see the devil's first attack on the seed that was just promised in the last chapter. Genesis 4, 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She thinks Cain is the promised seed, or at least is going to carry the seed, and she thinks Cain is the one. You, you see, Cain is actually a picture of the Antichrist, and they will also think the Antichrist is a man from the Lord. He's going to fool people. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Abel is the second one to come out. He was the one carrying the seed. And this pictures how your second birth is better. You see, your first birth didn't get you into the family of God when you were born of your mother. It was your second birth that got you in the family of God when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you got born again. That's what this pictures. Cain, the first birth, no good. 
The second one came out, Abel, he was the winner. And Genesis 4-3, and in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. Cain was the more religious one. He was more religious than Abel. He brought the offering first. But Abel understood what Adam and Eve most likely had told him. And that is, you need a bloody animal sacrifice to temporarily cover your sins. And Abel, he also brought the first length of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. You see, he's got respect in that bloody animal sacrifice. That was going to temporarily cover his sin. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Cain just brought the fruit of the ground. The religious man who thinks he can earn his way into God's favor by his fruits gets angry when he finds out he isn't good enough to earn his way into eternal life. That's why when you talk to a religious person and you tell them, their good works aren't getting them to heaven. They get angry because they're religious. They think they can earn their way in. They think they're good enough, but none of us are good enough. The devil most likely moved Cain to kill Abel because Abel was carrying the seed. And that old serpent thought he could get rid of the seed before it bruises his head. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. And am I, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So imagine the scene of the crime. The world's first murder has just taken place. And you didn't need fingerprints. You don't need a forensic team. You don't need CCTV. It was obvious who done it. I mean, who would have been able to do it? Who would have been there to do it? Cain, obviously. But you see, there's something about that blood. God has it fixed to where it cries from the ground, and you just about can't get rid of it. I've seen this one story where a man murdered some little girls in the basement of his house, and they found traces of the blood down there 30 years later after he had moved out and everything, and they got him 30 years later. The voice of that blood cries. God's got it fixed that way. And Cain runs away from the presence of the Lord, builds the first city, Starts a family. And look at some of his descendants here in Genesis 4.21. Jubal. He was the father of all as such as handle the harp and organ. So the first time music shows up, it shows up in a wicked line of people. You see, the devil has been twisting the music since Genesis chapter 4. And Zillah, she also bare Tubalcain, an instructor of every art artist. Artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. So you'll notice that iron is usually always negative in the Bible. You see it in Daniel with the iron mixed with the miry clay. And just when you think the devil thinks he's gotten rid of the seed, Adam and Eve have another son. Genesis 4:25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So Abel was carrying the seed. He was killed. The devil thinks, well, I've got, I've got rid of that seed. But now here is Seth, and he will carry the seed. All right, now Genesis chapter 5, you got the generations of Adam. And this chapter is where you see the first time that death is mentioned. And it's the generations of Adam. This should remind you that in Adam all die. If you're not saved, then you're still in Adam. You need to get out of Adam and get in Christ. In Genesis 5, 4 through 5, it says, In the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. No matter how long you live, you are still going to die. You need to realize that each second that ticks by is a second that's gone from your very short life that you can't ever get back. And this is why when I do a Bible lesson, I don't spend much time on stories. I don't spend much time on illustrations, bragging on myself, telling you about my personal life, my future plans. I don't want to waste your time. I want to get as much Bible crammed into your head in as short a time as possible that way you can move on to something else. 
I'm using your time right now. If you're actually listening to this, I'm using your precious time. So I want you to use your time wisely. So I'm going to help you use your time wisely. And next, we're introduced to another character in Genesis 5 named Enoch. And he pictures a believer who is alive at the rapture of the church. And if the rapture happened right now, you're still alive. And if you're born again, you would go up in the rapture, get a glorified body, and never die. That's pretty much what happens to Enoch. He, it says, and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. You won't be able to walk with God down here for 365 years, but you can walk with God for 365 days out of the year. But Enoch walked with God all that time. And it says in Genesis 5.24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He was translated that he should not see death. And that's the way it will be for you. If you're alive at the rapture, you'll be translated. You won't see death. Enoch's son Methuselah lived longer than anyone in history. I'm not sure why he's not in the Guinness World Records Museum in Gatlinburg, Tennessee that I went to, but I looked for him in there and never did see him. He was 969 years old and he died. Because in Adam, all die. Even if you're the oldest person or the the youngest person, you're going to die. You need to get in Christ.